Hello and welcome to our Bible study. Uh, today uh, we're going to be looking at uh, reason. If you remember, uh, last week we looked at scripture, one of the three legs of our stool of theology. So scripture, reason and tradition. Today we're going to be looking at reason. This begins from the idea that human beings are essentially rational creatures. We are people that think and wonder about things. Therefore, our reason should have a major role in understanding God. In the Old Testament, there are plenty of calls for people to seek after the wisdom, to seek after the understanding of God. The book of Proverbs, for example, is full of sayings about what it is to be wise and what being wise actually means. Proverbs 4, 7, for example, says the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Not a very helpful direction about how you actually go about doing it, but it shows how important these ideas of wisdom and understanding actually were. These ideas are not just confined to the Old Testament, but you find them also in the New. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, with some famous words that most of us might be familiar with, which says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that suffers from the translation into English when we use the word word. In Greek, the translation says logos, and logos is one of those words that have many meanings all wrapped up into it. It means uh, the words of understanding. It, it speaks about how people, when they say things, are making things clear to understand. So in the beginning, um, it says in the beginning, God was wisdom. Uh, Jesus was wisdom, knowledge about. We see Jesus in his parables using the phrase here. You might have heard uh, in parables Jesus saying phrases like, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Now he's not just talking about uh, the ability to uh, hear noise and sound, but here again is the use of an overloaded word. To truly hear something is to truly understand something. So what Jesus is really saying is those who understand let them understand. That double use of the phrase to try and drive home how important understanding actually is. Reason, then, is in no small part what the scripture talks about. And to understand the scripture, that is, the Bible, we need to actively use our reason. In the first few hundred years of Christianity, a time often referred to as the patristic period. Uh, patristic here comes in, come from the word father. Of course, it wasn't just uh, men that were writing at the time, but it is their writings that have mostly survived. Uh, the reason why it's mostly men is probably uh, something for another conversation. Uh, in this time, we have some great writers writing uh, both deep and um, not so deep thoughts about what Christianity is and what it means. You'll, if you start looking at this period, you'll likely hear names like Athanasius, Thomas Aquinas, Tertullian, Augustine, Cyprian, Origen, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, and so on. They were all theologians, most of them bishops, but not all, who wrote great treaties on theology. Treaties basically being long letters about a certain point. And their writings, those of which that survive, are still influential today. They laid a foundation upon which generations of theolog uh, theologians and scholars have built upon sometimes strengthening one argument and sometimes calling to account another. Just because they were the first writers doesn't mean they were always right. 
They were argued with by people like Zwingli, Calvin, Martin Luther, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, and so on, right the way down to the modern day, with people like Barclay, Dodd and Brueggemann, Tillich, Rosemary Radford Ruther, uh, Rowan Williams, and so on, and so on. Now don't worry, I'm not going to expect you to remember these names, but I just want to, you to get a sense of how these people over centuries have been talking about what it means to apply reason to theology. The role of reason itself has been equally debated. Uh, for Aquinas, for example, faith goes beyond reason, having access to truth and insights of revelation which reason could not hope to fathom or discover unaided. Reason has the role of building upon that which is known by revelation, exploring it and what its implications might be. Etienne Gilson sees Christianity as being like a cathedral whose base rests upon the bedrock of human reason and whose superstructure rises beyond the realms accessible to pure reason. In the Enlightenment period, around the late 17th century and through the 18th century, people took reason all the way uh, and began to suggest that Christianity is a series of beliefs that are inconsistent with reason. There are even theologians in the Christian fold who hold such views, such as the now late Don Cupid, Cupid even. I'm very thankful to Alistair uh, McGrath for those, uh, for those um, quick overviews. And for those of you that are interested in where you might find a very easy and accessible uh, overview, um, Alistair McGrath's uh, Christian Theology is actually quite a book, good book, but I do warn you uh, of its thickness, which kind of just shows you how in depth this subject actually is. And that's just an overview. The first major debate, uh, it may surprise people to know, was about the person of Jesus. That is just how did the whole thing, well, work? Some people saw Jesus as being fully divine, that is, completely the spirit of God. And they, uh, they worked by suggesting that he was so perfect and so divine that actually uh, he would float just a little above the earth because he was so pure he couldn't touch the earth and sully it, uh, sort of making him very much more God. The people that thought this sort of began taking it to extremes and eventually it becomes a heresy called Gnosticism. Now, heresy is one of those words that you will hear bandied about quite a bit um, in the sort of the more extreme and slightly more tense parts of Christian theology. Heresy basically means a thought that is not compatible with the central teachings of Christianity, almost a wrong way of thinking. Now, we'll deal with um, with some very uh, varied heresies probably later in videos, but not all everything that began as heresy ended as heresy, and not all things that were declared heresy are still considered heresy today. Um, uh, some people thought that Jesus was fully mortal, so that he was just a man who had some really good insight into who God was. To deal with the divine aspect, that a miracle and miraculous way in which he lived his life, they saw him as being adopted by God. And in that adoption to being God's son, he gained a share of God's power. This again led to the heresy known as adoptionism. Now, please bear in mind that these are extreme views and little bits of uh, of those views will kind of form something but taking them all to one extreme or the other is what makes them a heresy eventually after a lot of debates um and around this subject taking uh almost 300 years we end up uh, with the 
with the sort of the the description that we now hold to today and for those of you um, watching this description might seem a bit obvious uh, but it did take a lot of thinking and a lot of discussion about all the implications and how this might apply and what it means for this understanding and that understanding for us to get there so we now think, having settled after many years, that Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time. The precise nature of how that worked was largely left undecided and, of course, has been a topic of debate and discussion ever since. That debate was so important because it began speaking a lot about and had many implications on other aspects of theology. It talked about what Jesus' action on the cross meant. If he was just a man, could he die on the cross as expiation for everybody's sin? So he would need to be divine, to be the perfect sacrifice, and therefore to be able to take on everyone's sin. If he was fully divine all the time, then could he really know what it's like to be mortal? Wouldn't it just be um, a person? Wouldn't it just be God wearing a hu human suit? And therefore, all the emotions and the trials and difficulties of being human wouldn't really be effective. And it would mean that God doesn't really understand what it is to be us, and he would be a distant and aloof God. So all of these things needed to be taken into account when coming up with our conclusion that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And of course, the person of Christ and exploring the person of Christ is a big section of theology in its own right. And it's called Christology. Again, uh, stay with us and we will cover Christology probably in a much later video. Following on from that debate came the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, not one that we really talk uh, a lot about uh, in churches, which I think is um, a bit of a shame, uh, is the movement of God in the world. And the Holy Spirit is credited with being able to give us wisdom, to give us insight. It is the Holy Spirit that moves amongst us, um, that is the part that God breathed into us. The Holy Spirit um, is one of the first times that you begin to see proper tensions between the East and the West. The East, um, having centres of theology on Constantinople and Ariok, and the West being centred around Rome. In the West, the Holy Spirit was seen to come from both God and Christ, thereby making him, uh, making her co-creator, making her uh, co-part of the Trinity. In the East, the Holy Spirit was seen to proceed, that is to come from, uh, just Jesus. So Jesus um, was the one that brought the Holy Spirit into the world. And again, these had implications for all sorts of areas of theology. These debates were often held by letter and by treaties. One person would write a letter and then a whole host of people would respond to that letter, letting people to respond and so on and so on. It's a form of theology that still goes on today. And it's one of the ways in which a lot of uh, science and other aspects of our world continue. One person will write an article in a journal, which will then be responded to critiquing and expanding, pulling holes in their theory in another journal, in another article, giving the original author a chance to respond and to strengthen their argument. Of course, in the modern world on journals, that can take months with journals only coming out quarterly. And so we're used to this rather slow pace of theology developing. It wasn't just in these long and slow process of treaties that theology developed. It was also in things called councils or synods. 
Now we believe that this is something that began from the very beginning of the church. In the book of Acts, we can see people coming together to discuss uh, issues raised by St. Paul. We know that at least in small areas, small parts of the church, the see, that is the area over which a bishop uh, is uh, rules, would come together to form a council and to debate issues. Um, often in the early years, uh, the ways in which bishops would rule, condemning this heresy or accepting some other form of teaching. It was a long time before we get to what we would uh, now think of as the ecumenical councils. This is where churches of all kinds are called to send a representative to come together. Perhaps the most well known of these would be the Council of Nicaea. There were, all in all, seven of these ecumenical councils debating various different points. So important were these councils that they came together to debate central aspects of theology. Those of you that have spent some time around the church will know that as a part of our service, we say a thing um, uh, um, that comes from the Nicaea, the, um, and, and it is from that, this, um, this Nicaean creed, that comes out of the council at Nicaea. It wasn't ratified in the council of Nicaea, but later, but it was in Nicaea that the foundations began. This creed is a form of words that comes together to define what people agreed on in those councils. So when you come together and say these creeds, they each, each and every word in them has been thought about and debated um, over many days. And of course, these councils were based on the treaties of individuals that came before them. That is how our reason has been applied to form the very core values of what it is to be our church. Now, I don't want the, you to go away with the impression that these councils were as modern councils are, which is where we gather together, we have long conversations, and then we go into breakout groups where we continue those conversations before coming together and feeding back to the main body. In fact, if you were to have a look at the news uh, or, well, not recent news, but uh, the synod um, in the church in Wales normally a very uh, um, welcoming and normally a very uh, comfortable place to be has had some quite tense moments, especially, for example, around the uh, seeking to make women bishops. The Church of England's synod, however, is a bit more vocal. And if you are, if you were to spend a bit of time um, having a look at it, you will find that their people are quite more able and quite free to discuss things in a lot more of a free and frank way, shall we say, uh, leaving often to people being disappointed and lots of quite negative feeling around their synod. Perhaps it's because they are aping the original synod, though I hope not too closely. We know that in coming together to, for some of these early ecumenical synods, there were quite a bit of um, debate and not just a little bit of blood spilled in coming to bring these together. There are stories of people being waylaid on their road to, uh, to a council to reduce the number of people who would be there to vote for a certain form of wording even up to these people being uh, perhaps murdered on the way. The debates in the chamber themselves uh, were not always um, careful and well-worded, but there are some records that in some councils, people would break out into fist fights over disagreements. Reason then not showing its strongest form in these councils and people letting their emotions get the better of them. It has to be said that a lot of these 
core decisions made in the ecumenical council still stand today. The Nicene Creed, for example, stands the test of time as being one that is roundly accepted, as being the very core way of being able to say, yes, I'm a Christian, because I agree with what is said in the council of, uh, in the Creed of Nicaea or in the Apostles' Creed, a similar um, earlier creed that was designed to talk about our core values. And we will talk more about the creeds when we come to uh, talking about tradition, because the creeds are a, form, a firm part of our tradition. It should also be said that reason played a role in putting together the Bible itself. It was through people reading the scriptures and bearing in mind at the time they weren't a collection of letters, but uh, they weren't a collection that we have today, but individual pieces. And they were read in churches and gathered and hoarded together. In fact, we have a lot of books that were also rams that very nearly made it as being part of the scripture, part of what we call the canon of scripture, uh, that didn't quite make it. A book called The Shepherd of Hermas didn't make the cut. A book called The Didache didn't make the cut. These books um, were left out because they weren't universally accepted or that um, they didn't really chime as having a depth of spiritual guidance that people needed. They, coale they coalesce around festal letters. Um, Athanasius, uh, the name we mentioned before, in his festal letter, wrote a, let uh, a list of the books that he considered to be acceptable to be read in his churches. And this list became the core list that took fire and most people agreed with. And there were debates about those books. Revelation, for example, that really uh, fascinating, interesting book at the end of the Bible, very nearly didn't make it in at all. And it was only by the very late attribution to John that it made it in at all. Attribution being people saying it was written by John. Now, uh, that point is still being debated today, but its inclusion in the scripture is one that has managed to stand the test of time. If you can remember in our lecture over scripture, when we talked about the Reformation, people applied their reason to scripture again and began asking questions about some of the books contained therein. And they formed together the Apocrypha. These are the books that didn't quite make the cut for the reformists uh, forming our new, uh, our new Bible today. So reason then becomes quite an important leg in our three-legged stool. It is one of those that was used to make scripture. It is our reason that forms the foundation of tradition. And as you will see in this video, at the very beginning, I use scripture to justify my inclusion of reason as one of the three legs of our stool. Hopefully you'll begin to see how our stool is so intertwined that it becomes very difficult to separate them completely. I hope that this video has been informative and I do hope that you will join us for next week's uh, Bible study where we'll be looking at tradition. I hope you've enjoyed it and that you will join us again next week. Thank you very much. Hope you've enjoyed yourself and have a great week. Thank you.